Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, your go-to source for insider knowledge and everything related to photography and videography. Our mission is to keep you at the forefront of the industry, which is why we have spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and in today's episode, we're talking about why no matter how successful you are, literally nobody cares about your images. So buckle up, grab a cold one, and let's shake it up with today's guest right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 153. But hold up, before we get into today's episode, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be right down here somewhere on the screen. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the world-leading and award-winning automotive and aviation photographer, educator, speaker, and the man single-handedly responsible for changing the way front wheels are photographed on cars. Give it up <laughs> for Mr. Tim Wallace. Hey, Tim, Matt, how are you? Hi, man. You're okay. I'm good. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm great. It's actually great to have you on the show. I've been trying to get you on the show for such a long time. <laughs> it's well, no, it's yeah, amazing I, to see it. That's good. That's good. I'm here. So I'm here. That's it. Fantastic. Tim, we're going to talk about business predominantly on this episode, but I just want to dive into your automotive photography to start with so that um, for those listeners and viewers who don't know your work, uh, although I doubt there'll be many, um, so that we understand what your background is. Um, so what initially drew you to specialize in automotive and aviation photography? I think really, I mean, I did photography from a very young age. So I first sort of picked up a camera when I was about eight or nine years old. Um, but my my introduction into photography really wasn't through using a camera, it was through printing. So my grandfather used to take pictures and, and stuff like this and, and everything else. And I, I ended up in a garden shed, basically learning how to develop and print stuff. Um, so printing and that side of things was how I got into photography at a very young age. And then I just picked a camera and started taking pictures myself. Um, that said, my first job when I was 16 was working in a dark room. So I worked in dark rooms for newspapers, which was, um, yeah, some interesting stories there. Oh. Um, but my whole love was printing. So I, and I still nowadays, even now I, I, I still love the whole magic of just printing i know it's not digital and it's very old school and everything but that it's just a method and it's a bit of an art form and i still really enjoy it but i i went into photography from the dark rooms to working for agencies and people like that um and that was sort of quite a long time ago because i'm quite old now um, and and basically what happened was that the recession we had a little bit of a recession in the late 80s when that happened um, all the magazines, newspapers, everything else, they're all using staff photographers. They won't use an agency photographers. So all of a sudden, um, there was just nothing in it. There was just no work for agencies and freelancers. It was it was a pretty dire time. So I went into media and I went into networks and things like that. And I did that for years. And I I, I ended up as like um, head of networks with Virgin doing like, broadband and TV stuff and all the rest of it. So I worked on the other side of the desk in media, if that makes any sense. So I understand how a company thinks and how a business works with budgets and things like that. So it, it was useful, but I did that for years. And some bits of it were good and the guys that worked for me were great and everything else and the engineers, but it was just endless meetings, and peer reviews and, and things like that. And they then decided to relocate the operation to Liverpool. Um, and what happened there was they said, well, you either move to Liverpool or you take redundancy. So I took redundancy and sat down and thought, shit, what am I going to do now? I was always taking pictures in my own time because it's something I enjoyed to do. And everyone used to say to me, you're really good. You should do this as a living. And I'm like, mm, not so sure. And I remember saying to my dad, um, my dad sadly died actually the month that I started my business. But I, I remember saying to my dad the original idea and saying, Look, I'm going to become a commercial photographer. That's what I would have done. And my dad just said, It's not really a proper job, is it? You know, it's not, it's not really a proper job, Tim. You know, you need to find something else. But I was pretty determined and I sat down and I wrote a business plan for about five days at my daughter room table. 
And the thing that I, I sort of looked at, rather than look at it just from the point of view of, I enjoy taking pictures of landscapes or I enjoy taking pictures of this and that, I thought, right, I've just been made redundant from a job that pays me quite a lot of money. I need to get back up to that level and work for myself so I'm in control of my own future. So I looked at it from a business point of view and thought, right, what can I do? I wanted to do commercial work, but I wanted to do stuff um, that not a lot of other people were doing. There's a lot of car photographers out there. There's a lot of guys that shoot cars for magazines and things, but I didn't want to get into that. I wanted to do brochure work. I wanted to do studio work. And it's quite difficult. It's quite technical. But in some ways, the harder something is, the less people are in the game sort of thing. So I spent ages and ages teaching myself and training myself how to do it and trying to improve. And some of my early stuff, I look back at it even now sometimes and just think, oh my God, how the <laughs> hell did she do that? Do you know what I mean? Because the more you do something and the more you become familiar with it and aware of it, the more you look at it with a more critical, experienced eye. So even if I look back at something I shot six months ago, I think, how, how did you miss that? How did you not see that? How did you not correct that? It's just the experience and it grows and grows. And this was like nearly 18 years ago. So I've been doing this now for quite a long time. Um, but the car industry was just something that interested me. Everyone thinks I'm a car freak. I love cars. Yeah, I do like cars like most guys. I like cars, but I'm not a complete car nut. To me, cars are more like sculptures, um, and it, it's just something that interests me. And from the car work, it went on to doing stuff like uh, big trucks and stuff like that. So it's transport-based. And then about six years ago, I decided to sort of try and branch out into aviation a little bit so that all my eggs were in one basket, so to speak. Um, and it, that was quite a difficult thing to do because everyone knew me as the guy who shoots cars and, and you introduced me in, a, in sort of the same way which which is understandable in a way but I spent the last six years trying to get away from that and trying to go look I'm transport based photographer if it's transport that's what I specialise in because one of the big things in business is that I know a lot, I talk to a lot of people I, I do I do talks at universities to people who are going through the end of degree courses to become photographers and things and, and everyone sort of says the same thing that well you need to do a little bit of everything you need to do babies and weddings and and because you need to get as much work as you can I totally disagree with that absolutely disagree you've got to specialize because at the end of the day if you do a bit of everything you're never really going to be known for anything at all you know, if you if you want to get into earning two, three, four thousand pounds a day shooting in studio and doing something, you need to be the top of your game. And to be at the top of your game, you need to be one of the best there is around. Um, and that you've got to specialise. So that's why I sort of specialise. So moving into aviation six years ago was quite nerve wracking because it was like mm, it's off at a tangent, but I've sort of successfully pulled it off. Apart from with you, obviously, that still think I should cast all that. <laughs> well, not really, because I, I have, I have, um, I have seen your aviation photography. Because I have sort of a, uh, I have a kind of a personal um, attachment to that, you know, in general. Uh, and that's that's because basically during the pandemic, what happened is I'm, I'm a headshot and portrait photographer, really. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's my background. But um, during the pandemic, of course, as you know, in the UK, we're pretty drastic. Um, lockdown and yeah, yeah. Um, and of course all of a sudden you know photographing other humans was sort of outright illegal <laughs> so I basically had to stop doing that <laughs> um, and and uh, my friend Nick and I we had just started this podcast and so we interviewed somebody called um, actually no we 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 read an article on a website about a guy called David Cox um, over in LA he's a British expat and what he had done was um, he gone out at night and he'd light painted classic cars. And that was just his sort of lockdown activity they did, you know, dressed dressed all in black like a ninja. <laughs> you know, I used to sneak out, light paint these cars in like under a minute and then rush off, you know, not to be caught. And and I thought, well, you know, that's a really good idea, actually, because I can photograph cars. I can go out there and photograph cars. That's that's still legal, I guess, <laughs> you know. And yeah. uh, and the interesting thing about that was, I mean, there's, there's two things. First of all, it, it dipped me to the world of good in terms of learning new techniques, like light painting cars. 
Um, and also, it really showed me the difficulties in photographing cars. Like, it's just like everything's reflective on a damn thing. Like, this everything's curved, everything's reflective. It's you know, it's um, it's it's a real photographic challenge. And I think yeah, the yeah, important yeah. thing, of course, always is when you're, you know, in order to grow as as a photographer, I'd say as an artist, but just simply to grow technically at what you do, it's always good to set yourself a new challenge like that. Yeah. I think yeah. A, a lot of people say to me, how can you fail? Because if you get, I mean, I've shot brochures from McLaren and the guy, you're so lucky, he's so, he's so amazingly lucky to do this work for McLaren. I think the reality is something completely different. If you take like a brochure sheet for McLaren, um, so a brochure sheet is about 43 to 46 shots. So that's going to be externals, internals, bits of accessories and stuff like that, close-ups of things on the car. We'll probably spend about 14 hours a day in studio for about six days to do those shots. So that's a lot of work in studio. Before that happens, before we even get into the studio, the reality is that you've probably got about 10 to 14 meetings that last an hour to two hours to discuss the ins and outs of everything. Um, McLaren as a as a business is is pretty similar to lots of other businesses where when their when their budgets are massive to do a, a massive campaign launch the 720s Spider or something like that. Um, lots of P people in different departments are involved. These people don't talk to each other. Then they disagree with each other. Then everyone's got an opinion. And you think, can we just get into the studio? And then you get into the studio, and three cars are delivered. And maybe one of them's not quite what you expected. I it's gloss black with loads of carbon fiber, and you just think, ah, you know, this is going to be a nightmare. Um, and then you've got your shot list, and you start, and it, it's the reality is, is not the same. You know, it's it's not as easy as people think. Do I enjoy it? Yes, absolutely, thoroughly enjoy it. Is it technically difficult? Yes. Do I enjoy it being technically difficult? Probably, yeah, if I'm honest, because one of my big loves in life is lighting. I love lighting. I love what you can do. And, and sometimes if you just simplify things. I remember we did, a, I think it was, a, a, I think it was actually a 720S brochure. And they were changing the wheels on one of the cars. So they were changing it for a different set of carbon fiber alloy wheels. And while they were doing that, we had one of them parked at the back of the studio and it had its doors up. So its doors, instead of opening like that, they sort of opened up. And one of the lights that we'd used, because we shoot all in continuous light. So everything we do in studio is continuous light so we can see exactly what we get. Um, it was, the, the light was sat in front of the car facing the wall so it sort of silhouetted the car and I just looked at it and I thought it looks a bit like an angel you know it's just sat there in silhouette so I ended up spending just 15 minutes which is really quick and did this shot at the rear of this car it wasn't on the shot list it wasn't to be done but I did this shot at the rear of the car with the doors up in silhouette just lighted little bits of the grill and stuff like that um and it ended up being used as the screensaver for McLaren as a company for about two years. And it wasn't even on the shot list. It was just something that we did. But like I say, it's a long process. So once we've done all that, we've had editing. Uh, and editing has to be absolutely pixel perfect. You, 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 you spend probably about two, I spent about two weeks editing all this stuff down so it's absolutely perfect. And then somebody in marketing will send you back a little thing and there'd be a little green circle on it going there's a pixel there that looks like it's not right and you're like uh you know yeah. and everything's got carbon fiber on it and carbon fiber looks great until you light it because when you light it if there's any imperfections it'll show so all you've got to do is clone it if you want to do drugs and sleepless nights. Try cloning carbon fiber weed. It's just like, ah, oh, I can't, you know, but you learn to do it. And it's just part of the game. It's just part of what you've got to do. Yes, I found that really interesting, actually. You know, um, retouching cars is so different from retouching faces, which is I'm, I'm used to. You know, I'm used to retouching skin and hair and all the rest of it. Um, but getting into retouching surfaces on cars uh, was a real learning curve as well. You know, not only 
they're not only like taking license plates out or whatever, but but like literally retouching all the curves and all the um, the all the reflections on it and, and and creating reflections that weren't there before because it fits with with the image and stuff like that. It was very 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 satisfying actually. Try and keep the re- when we shoot in studio, we try and keep the retouching down to a bare minimum because right. there's enough to do anyway as it is. So if we do like a, a car interior. So you take a like a, a typical brochure shot car in terms of McLaren. It takes about three hours to light it. So we don't do anything apart from set up all the lights. And it that's about, I'd say that's about two and a half to three hours. And there's big scaffolding over it and everything else. And yeah. you've, got, <laughs> you've got all sorts of issues with things. Because if you think of a car windscreen, it's got like a, on McLaren anyway, it's got a slightly green tint to it. So you're lighting continuous light tungsten. And that's coming through, part of that's going to be coming through the windscreen to light a little bit of soft across the top of the dash. But that's now going to be affected by the green tint. So you then need to pink what we call pink up with a pink gel on the tungsten light so it balances so it's back to the correct tungsten temperature. And it's just stuff like that. So you get to know the, the, the sort of tinted ratios of different types of cars, Lexus is this, BMWs that, McLarens are a nightmare because they're very they're a lot greener than you think. Do you know what I mean? And we set all this up and we do all this and then we take a few shots and then we move on to the next one. When we're doing an exterior of a car, because uh, it's continuous, I don't like lots of people in the studio. I don't like to be cluttered with people. So it's just me and a lighting assistant and either he's at the camera and I'm on the lights, or he's on the lights, and I'm at the camera, and I'm literally looking down exactly where I'm shooting. And we might be saying, just move that light, just spread it slightly, bit less, bit more, move it two inches to the right, and then you get that perfect line and that perfect reflection. But it takes time, you know? It's satisfying when you get it right, but it takes time. If you try and correct things in Photoshop with cars, it never really ends well, if I'm honest. You need, yeah. that's the one, it's the one thing you need to try and do in camera if you can't. Yeah. Well, it's, right. uh, so the technique I used was uh, basically I light painted the, the whole thing. So I took loads of shots of individual parts of the car and then essentially um, yeah, yeah. composited the whole thing together, which was interesting because you can get, you can light things sort of in a, in a fairly unnatural way. You know, you can light things that wouldn't normally be lit. And so you can, you can get out a lot of detail. And of course, these shots don't look realistic. They look hyper real, I would call them, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was it was an interesting thing. It was just like, it was uh, something fun to get into um, during a period when photographing other humans wasn't, you know, wasn't a thing. But um, in what way are the challenges different uh, when it comes to photographing um, planes and, and helicopters in, in, in uh, comparison to cars? Cars are difficult. When I started doing the aviation stuff, because obviously you don't really do aviation in studio, Although there is a possibility that there's a new helicopter coming out uh, from a manufacturer in Italy, we might actually do it in studio, which will be a bit weird and a bit big. If I'm very cool, (laughs) sounds cool to me. (laughs) But then again, I've done these massive tractor trailer unit trucks in studio. There's a big studio in uh, in Carby in England, and I've done a massive, literally like looks like an oil tanker, and I've taken that into studio and lit that. Excuse me. Um, but I think most of the aviation stuff is done outside, so it's still lit. It depends, really, because if it's if it's on the ground and it's done as like a brochure job, then it's still lit. But it's, it's just inevitably strobe lit. I have a series of massive poles that are like 30 to 40 feet long. And there's lit. if you saw it in real life, it's comical because there's me. <laughs> With like a radio trigger, I'm all set up. And then you've got this light on the end of a pole and you're like, right, is that the right place? And it it just comes from experience in knowing the angles because it's all to do with the angles of where the light is to the object back to the camera. So um, do I need a hard light? Do I need a soft light? And that hankers back to the days of printing. And if lots of people who are probably going to watch this probably have never printed it in their life, so it probably won't make sense what I'm about to say. But when you print, when you print, um, you basically use different used to use different grades of paper. Like grade one's very soft, 
two is normal, three slightly harder, and it's just contrast in the image. When I light, I still think in my head of grade one to four in terms of contrast. So for me, in all seriousness, it's not about just getting light on a subject. It's about how hard or soft that light is, which is probably why I'm quite good at doing cars because if you think about when you're shooting a car in studio, um, you need soft pools of light, but you also need these ridges of hard light for the shape, the curves and everything else. So it's very, very different. Aircraft, I think, is a lot easier. So I'm doing a lot more of it now. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's not in studio, but I I do love being in studio. I do I do honestly love being in studio because when you get the lights in absolutely perfect, it is like even now years and years later, it's just like wow, look at that, look at it. You can see it. You don't yeah. have to composite it. You're not trying to retouch it into looking like that. It's there in front of your eyes. You can see what that light is doing. It can just take a few hours to get there, but it, that's yeah. Studio. It's also the part of actually crafting the light, you know, to do exactly what you want it to do, uh, rather than having to rely on whatever the environment gives you at that point. Yeah, you know, that's... and it, I mean, I use all sorts of daft things in studio that you probably, it's like if you walked into a work in studio where you do lots of cars, in the car you'll see piles of milk bottle crates, plastic milk bottle crates, because they're commonly used all around the world in car studios to prop up boards and things like that. A car studio that doesn't have milk bottle crates in the corner is not a proper car studio, you know? <laughs> it's like when you light wheels, when you light alloy wheels, the trend in the last few years is to get a bit of like spark or reflection on the floor. But the problem is the way the alloys are often cut, you can't get that re that natural reflection. So uh, my answer is a bit of a trade secret, this, but I'll let it out. My answer is just to take a roll of tinfoil you get a roll of tin file and then tin file your wheel with with baking tin file. You can then light the tin file and that'll sparkle back a reflection onto the floor. So there's all sorts of weird things we do, you know. But it's just as I say, it's just part of doing it. So what would be your sort of your, your top tip for anybody who wanted to get into photographing cars or planes or helicopters or any any moving vehicle? Uh, what would be sort of your number one tip to start out with? If you're going to clear this and live it. If you want to make money from it and earn a living from it, you need to think about what you're going to shoot and why you're going to shoot that. I I did prestige cars. So I, you'll never find a picture of mine of a Renault Scenic or whatever, or Ford. I do Aston Martins, I do McLarens. And it's not because it's, ooh, it's Aston Martin and McLaren, how posh. It's the fact that their budgets are bigger. The style of images they need suits my style of shooting. Most of my car work is coming out of the darkness. It's a bit aggressive. It's very, it's very sculptured light. You're not going to get an advert for a Ford Focus that's shot that way. That's going to be by a beach with somebody with a set. That's not me. That's not my style. So you've got to, my top tip is to shoot what you enjoy shooting, that you have a passion for, because that'll show in your work. But it's got to have an end purpose. So what's the end purpose? Who's going to buy this? It is your style of shooting right for the type of client that you're going for. Let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. DVE Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thank you to DVE Store for the high def video. And of course, you can find a link to DVE Store in the description. Yes, I think a funny thing. Uh, it, so during the pandemic, I shot, I, you know, I get, like I said, I shot a few cars. And, um, and I, had, I have a friend who owns a Ferrari. And so yeah. I, was, uh, I was shooting the Ferrari quite a lot. And then, of course, he went to Ferrari events and stuff. So I, I shot a lot of Ferraris, which is great. And uh, it was super good fun and a, and a real experience. Um, and then very weirdly, I got a phone call from somebody who'd seen the imagery and asked, they uh, own a cleaning company and had just bought this 200,000 pound street sweep, like road sweeper mobile yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. he wanted shooting in exactly the same way. I'm like, okay, well, that's different. 
but it's probably the best photograph of a of a road sweeper ever created. <laughs> no, I mean, so yeah, I mean, like I say, I do McLarens and stuff like that, and and I've done work with Ferrari and everything else. Look. But then I've shot, I shoot bin lorries. So Daddy Siegel, yeah. refuge lorries, bin lorries, whatever you want to call them, and I shoot the brochure work for them. And people would be like, "Why are you shooting a refuge lorry? That's not very interesting." But I love it; it's great because yeah. they're quite hard to shoot. Do you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Exactly. And then, so my truck work is is probably one of the, some of the most enjoyable stuff I do. It's big, and it's interesting that we if we were doing a brochure for like i don't know say there's a new type of truck out that mercedes have made or something like that historically we would take that in studio but when we were in lockdown the studios were closed uh-huh. yeah and suddenly we had a nightmare because we couldn't do location work because some of the locations that we were trying to use they were like no you can't do that you can't have people around and everything else the studios were closed um and a lot of the manufacturers we're sending factory workers home, so the factories were half empty. So I thought, right, okay, well, I need to carry on working. So I had a bit of uh, work I was doing for a, um, a Dutch company called Turbo that make different trucks and vehicles and everything, like park tractors and all this sort of stuff. And they needed some stuff doing. And I said, well, look, is the factory empty? And they're like, well, yeah, the, the West End side of the factory is just completely empty because all those guys are off at the moment. I'm like, right, we'll do it in the factory. So I ended up, for the first time, lighting big vehicles, not with continuous light, but with strong on the end of a stick, and then compositing those images together to make it, to, to blend it all through and everything, and then taking it out of the factory background and put it into what looked like a studio background. And the first couple of attempts I did at this, it was just absolutely horrendous, you know? But like anything, you work at it, you work at it, you work at it. It's, it's your living, it's your job, so you've got to do it. Um... And I've I perfected it. And sometimes now it's like one of my USPs in the fact that some of my clients know that if they've got a really big vehicle, but logistically they can't get it into studio, that technically speaking, we could do it where it is. You know, it's it's tough going, but it's one of those things in business that you've just got to give what a client needs, really. Well, that's actually, that brings me to a question that I have for you. Um, What's your process for identifying and solving problems for your clients? In respect to the whole thing. I mean, if if we, if I work for a client, uh, a lot of my clients, I'd, I mean, I've had a few clients disappear because they've gone out of business, but every client I've ever worked for, I've never really lost a client. So I've got lots of clients. Although some clients I work, work for for about two or three years because they don't need loads of stuff. Some are like five times a year. But I get to know their businesses and I get to know them. So I get to know what's important to them and what their problems are. Um, you've got to bear in mind that when I shoot a vehicle, whether it's a Ferrari, whether it's a, a tanker, whether it's a helicopter, whatever, I'm not shooting it for me. I'm shooting it for them. And that's a massive mistake that some people make. They go, all right, well, I've got this helicopter to shoot. I'm going to make it come out of the darkness and look dramatic and look like it's on fire and everything else. And that's not what they want, you know? What's important to them is the, the clarity of this or the brightness of that or that you're showing that or you're not showing something else. Um, so the first thing I do is sort of understand what they need properly, not what I think looks good but what they need. And then once I know what they need, then we try and make that as visually effective as possible for what they're trying to push, what they're trying to chase, what they're trying to get across. And I think that's important because you might be a photographer, but you if it's your business, you're in business, so acts like a business. Businesses do people do business with other businesses and people do business with other people. But you've you've got to get into their mindset of what they want because they're paying you a lot of money to do it. It's not for me, it's for them, you know? And I think that's one of the things. It's like, I've been in America and I've, I've got onto the stage and I've talked about business and everything else and I'm famous for jumping on stage and starting with my opening line, which horrifies everyone by saying, no one gives a shit about pictures. And everyone's like, what? You know, but the reality is, a client doesn't, you know? 
if you're showing them a portfolio of stuff or if they're looking at previous work you've done, they're not buying that work. They're buying your style, your experience, and your capability of producing something that they want. If you can show that your style fits their brand, because if you go into big companies like McLaren and Mercedes, branding and how something looks from a branding point of view is crucial to them. So if your style of work doesn't fit into their brand, then they're not going to touch it, no matter how good you are, you know? So a portfolio shows your style, it shows your capability to produce the end result so they have confidence in you. But it also shows that, you know, you can understand what they need and you're capable of producing it. If we book a studio to do a brochure shoot and we're booking it for a week or two weeks, the the manufacturer's got three cars that have been produced just for this shoot. There might be prototype things on there. So these three cars... You're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds. They've got to have the confidence in you that at the end of it, they get what they want and they can trust you with it. Does that make sense? No, oh, absolutely. It's so. It, yes, it's it, in, 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 crucial. Yes, in other words, you're you got to get used to telling your client's story, not your own story, in the many yeah, ways. Exactly. I think I think a lot of people say to me like, "Oh, what should I include in the portfolio?" And, or oh, they'll go and visit a new client or they'll go to an agency and they'll get a portfolio and they'll go, oh, look at that, that's great. And look, this is a great picture I did of this and this is this picture of this Peugeot sports car and it looks great. They're not really interested. They're not buying those pictures and you're not selling those pictures. What you're selling is your ability and your experience and your capability because the guy behind the desk who's giving you a job it might be an art director or it might be head of commercial or something like that. It might be a bit of a wake-up call for some people, but his entire day is not focused on you and this shoot. He has six shoots to arrange in the next 12 months and you're shoot number two and you're a potential photographer number four on a list of five people, you know? He doesn't want to look up all this stuff. He just wants to know that he can give you the work You'll understand what he needs and he can then leave it with you and you will get on with it and do it. Because in this because in the next three hours he's got three Zoom calls, a staff disciplinary to go and hit you. His wife's kicking his ass about going out for lunch with her. And you are not the centre of his world. Do you know what I mean? So you have to I know it sounds really daft, but you have to focus on that. These people are busy. If you want to be successful in business, be consistent. That is my that is the greatest thing I will ever say to anybody about business. If you want to be successful, be consistent. Because that's all that matters to a client. So if they look at the work you've done and they consistently know that you can produce the same quality for them, that gives them that same feeling that right, I can I can put his name against that job and 99% sure that will be okay. Because if it's not okay, his ass will get kicked. Not yours. He might kick yours, but his boss is going to be on his back and then budgets have been blown and they've got to organize a reshoot. The amount of times I get an email through, probably about, in honesty, probably about three times a month, I get an email from somebody quite big that I've not worked for and they'll say, are you available to do a shoot like Bentley, for instance? Can you do it? We, we've got this 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 new interior headline for this Bentley, whatever. Um, can you do it? It's a studio shoot. I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I'll I'll sort out a quote for it. And tell me what the usage is, and we'll work out the cost. When when's the shoot? And then like, it's four days time. And you're like, what? You know, and why is it such short notice? And they'll be like, oh well, you know, things have happened. And you know it's a reshoot because the first shoot just didn't work. Something went wrong. Somewhere along the lines, it, did, it didn't happen. It didn't work. It went wrong. It wasn't what they wanted. And they're trying to get onto it as quick as possible to still meet the deadline. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. So how did you, um, or what, what strategies did you use to build your, like your brand's uh, reputation in that respect? My brand is in my company. Yeah. Um. It's just really 
trying to keep a consistent style and trying to be a, you see the thing is that you can work hard at doing the shoots and you can work hard at producing really good quality work and that will get you to a reasonably high level in the game but once you're there the hardest thing is then trying to stay there and the other thing is that <laughs> there's a thing I always say about everything you see and hear influences you agreed Absolutely. Right. Whatever influences you influences what you do when you take a picture. So when I take a picture of something, part of my personality goes into the way that I shoot it uh, and the way that I feel at that time. Um, so it's very important to sort of get your head around the fact that you need to be in a positive space, but you also need to move forward. So a lot of people have said to me before, like, so... Do I look at other car photographers' work? Never, never, never do it. Avoid it like the play. Because as soon as you start looking at other people's work, you start being influenced by it. And if you're going to be influenced by it, then that's going to mirror into the work that you produce. And then basically, you're not really creative anymore. You're just doing a, what a Dan version of what he just did. So the hardest thing for me and my brand is trying to think of new ways to do stuff that's still commercial, so it appeals to a client, but it's maybe something they haven't seen before. So it gives me a bit of an edge that they go, wow, that's interesting. Never seen that done that way before. You know? So it's it's doing that, and it's trying to keep the brand so that people understand that what I do is transport. If it's got wings and wheels and rovers, then that's what I do, you know? It's difficult. I mean, I remember changing my company logo about three years ago. I think it was just before lockdown. I've never hummed and hard about a company logo so much in my entire life. I was like, I need a sort of logo because the current one is just shit, you know? And what can that be and what does it look like? And the last thing I want is a camera or something like that, you know? <laughs> I, I don't want anything like that. I don't want, like... I don't want anything on my profile page that's me with a camera because it's just it's just not commercial. It's just it just doesn't look right. So yeah, branding is always a difficult thing. Big companies spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds on branding, and there's just me sat on my own in an office trying to think, does that look okay? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I asked my wife, who has nothing to do with photography, but she loves me and she'll be honest with me. So I, I did a job I did a job a few weeks ago as helicopter based job. I did this one shot and I thought that's really unique. I've never seen a shot like that before. I think that looks great. I think the client's gonna love it. And she was working at home at the time. And we have a massive office here and she works on one side of the desk, I work on the other. And I just said, Have you got a minute? And she's like, Yeah, yeah. I said, Come round it. I've what do you think of that? And I was expecting her to go, Wow, that looks amazing. She went, No. Nah. Doesn't look right, and I'm like, what? <laughs> but it's it's a it's a person's perception, so it doesn't matter what I think, but it does matter what she thinks because she was like, well, the way that guy stood, it just doesn't look right. It'd be better if he was like that, and I'm like, yeah, she's right, because I spent so much time shooting it and editing it that I've been too close to it, you know, and because I'm so close to it, I actually can't see that obvious thing anymore. You know, so it's good to get a good set of eyes on things. Sometimes if I have something that's really, really important, if I've got the time, if there's one or two shots involved, I'll just leave it for overnight or two days and then I'll go back to it and I will look at a fresh pair of eyes. And then you can sometimes look at it and think, God, that's horrifying. How did I miss that? You know? It's really important to sometimes just get some distance, you know, from that. And, uh, you know, in, in a former life, um, I, I used to be in music and, uh, and so, you know, I, I remember it was exactly the same thing in music. You know, you'd, you'd work on a piece, you'd write a piece of music, and, you know, you, you're so intensely focused on that, that you're almost like, you're like self-hypnotizing yourself into yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah. into thinking, this is yeah. great, this is the best thing ever. But then when you give yourself a little bit of distance, a few days or a few weeks, you know, sometimes a few months, and you get back to it and you realize, oh, wow, that that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> you know, um, right. it's the same with photography, really. I think the biggest problem that we all have as photographers is that we're creatives. You've got to be creative to be a photographer. 
I do I do believe that some people have a natural eye to things and that can't really be taught. You can get better at it through experience, but we're all creatives, which basically means, if we're honest, we all have OCD, you know? Most of the people I know have OCD. I have OCD. I don't have OCD. I have CDO. It's like OCD, but the letters are better organized. You know? <laughs> but as creatives, we make the worst business people in the world. Oh, 100%. I you couldn't know? agree in more. The amount of times I know photographers, they are really great photographers, but they don't know how to do a quote. Or they don't, they'll, like, they'll even say, I don't like asking for money. You know? And yeah. you're like, you're in business, you know? But I think this photographers and creatives, we've all done the same thing. We go, like, I love my work. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really great shot. I'm really doing good work. Actually, it's not so good. I'm not so sure about it anymore. I might delete that. Da 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 da. You know? And we go in these waves of ups and downs. And I think, from talking from a professional point of view, it's probably one of the two hardest things that we have to cope with as photographers, working photographers. Firstly, the fact that we love our work and we hate it, then we love it and we hate it. And we're never quite sure if it's good enough, you know? Yeah, um, we're always full of self-doubt. That's that's, a, that's oh the main God, problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like we're all Catholic, you know? We're <laughs> instantly feeling guilty about everything. Like, yeah. I've done this. I don't know if it's good enough. I don't know if I'm good enough, you know? They've asked me to do this shoot and I'm going through this imposter syndrome and I don't, have they got the right guy? Do they know who I am? And, and stuff like this. And even I get that now. I just think, yeah. wow. So I've got to do this sheet for Rolls Royce. And they want me to do a quote for it. And most people are like, wow, amazing opportunity. You'll nail this. In my head and in my heart, if I'm completely 100% honest, I'm going, shit. I don't know if I can do it. Do I want to do a quote? Shall I just say I'm, bit, I'm too busy? You know? Yep. And then I'll just go, right, I do what I always do, panic about it, and then just go, bugger it, let's just do it. And then I do it, and it works out okay, and I breathe a sigh of relief, and I'm still alive, and I move on. So even thinking who maybe look at what I do and think, oh, he's, he's, he knows what he's doing, and it's great. I, I still panic. Yeah, I still panic about stuff, you know? And it's, it, the thing about that, that sort of feeling of self-doubt, you know, it... It really has a major impact on how you value your own services as well. Yeah. So when it comes to you, know, you mentioned pricing, you know, writing quotes and pricing, for example. Um, it's so easy, especially in the beginning, especially when we're so, you know, so engulfed with the creative aspect of our of our work, and we can't really see, we can't really separate that from the business side of it. Um, it's so easy to completely undervalue your own services and therefore price something that's completely unrealistic. Um, yeah. And I've actually I found that that's had a detrimental effect on, on on you know on my ability to close a deal, because actually sometimes that completely backfires. You know because I'm you know I remember there was a time when I was I was really probably too shy to to really charge what need what I should have charged for a particular job, um, yeah, yeah. and that quote may have come in way under what other people you know quoted, and the impression that immediately was well so that's not going to be any good, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that that's the sort of thing that there's a difficult hurdle to get over. Uh -huh. And there's no easy answer to it. It just comes from experience. It's it's like I have a I have a set tier of clients and they're all basically the same level of business, the same level of expectation, and the same level of investment into their imagery. Through experience, I know roughly what they're expecting especially if I've worked for them before. But when people say, so how much should I charge? There's no answer. There is no answer to that. Yeah. I don't have a day rate. What I charge McLaren is different to what I charge Turbo in Holland. Totally different, you know? And you might be surprised to, to hear that if, if, if I put in the mix, something like, I don't know, uh, Turbo, um, the people who make wood chippers, I do all their brochure stuff for them, and McLaren. McLaren's probably one of the cheapest jobs out of the three because McLaren probably invests less than the other two. The other two have got bigger budgets, but you wouldn't think that. you think the biggest yeah. budget is McLaren. It's not the case, you know? It's different. So it, it's really sort of trying to 
work out in your head and and get that experience of doing it. it, it there's no easy answer to it. There there that's isn't a, a fast. Actually, it's it's an interesting thing because um somebody told me this before um and I can't, I'm trying to think who who that was, but it was a very similar conversation uh, in the sense that you know somebody said that well you know if you look at luxury brands and um, they have of course they have a budget for you know marketing and and advertising and so on, um but then you look at like the the Fords and VWs of our world, you know, yeah. the their budgets <laughs> are considerably bigger for those sort of acti- activities because as a business, they're setting way more models and, and you know, creating way more uh, content in that respect. So their budgets are going to be considerably, considerably bigger than that of a luxury brand. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I remember... Um... I got an email out of the blue. Oh, it was about it was probably seven, eight years ago. And it was from it was from a car manufacturer, a German one, but we won't mention who it is. <laughs> okay. And they mailed me and they said, uh, we've got this new model and we want a shoot doing, but we don't want a studio shoot. It's not a brochure shoot. It's all purely for social media. So it's more lifestyle. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So we need to talk, is it in the UK? Is it in Germany? You know, what's the time scale for it? everything else, da, 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 da. And they came back and they gave me some detail. And when I asked about the budget, uh, they said, well, we'd hope you do it for nothing. And then we'll put your name on the images on social media so you'll get something from it. And I'm like, I'm a business. Oh, yeah. I don't ever, and I know this is like a massive argument people have had over the years. And they'll have for many years to come. Should photographers work for free ever? I don't think they should. That's just my opinion. You're did, a whole, this. Exactly. did a whole episode about this for those of you different who are watching this. Business. Different businesses are probably different <laughs> reasons for saying yes, maybe. But I thought about it and I thought, rather than just mailing it back and saying no, I thought, be the person that I am, I mailed it back and I said, look, I'd be very happy to do the shoot. And it's very kind of you to mention me in the social media tags so that people know it's me that did the pictures. If you're willing to send me uh, a brand new car, okay, free of charge, then I'll let everyone know that it's a BMW or it's a whatever, like the lane slip there, um, and I'll let them know that you supplied it and I really like it and I'll take it and I'll, you know, and they were like, I can't give you a new car. I'm like, well, the amount of work you're talking about, it equates to probably about the same value, you know? So, but it, it's just one of those things. And I think, I think since lockdown, since COVID, since recession, since Ukraine, a lot of people are keeping a tight rein on budgets. Work is very different now, the last few years. There are some people who are really pushing their industries and their businesses, and their budgets are bigger than they ever were. But there are other people that are they're trying to be cautious with those budgets. So the whole landscape has changed even across my industries that I work in, is, is very, very different. People previous that, that maybe had a small or medium budget, they're now taking a market share because of the situation globally. And they're pushing like mad. So they're really hungry for new assets, new images, and you know their budgets are massive. So it changes all the time. It's, um, yeah, it's difficult, difficult time. Now that's why it's even more important to maintain strong relationships with your existing clients. Um, yeah. I'm guessing you're in order to ensure repeat business, for instance. So what do you do to um, ensure that you, that you build those strong relationships? Communication, basically. I mean, it's not really rocket science. I don't think it's rocket science, but I think when I'm talking to clients, one of the worst things that can happen to me is if my main point of contact with a client leaves the business because they do they move to other companies and then you've got to start a relationship with somebody else but so i tend to try and get farm good relationships with four or five people in the business quite high up i get to know them i wouldn't say we become massively friendly because that can be a downside as well to be too it's business at the end of the day so conduct it like a business but i think generally the goals and rules are just communicate keep in touch you know mail these people every now and again and see how they're doing. Keep an eye on what they're doing in their industry. If they've just been to a massive trade show and won an award, there's nothing in it for you. 
but mail them and just say, oh, I just happened to see that. That was really great. Looked good. Well done, guys. Good work, team. You know, try and be part of their team. I always try and work it so that when I'm working in an industry or a business or a big company, they almost see me as part of the employees, as part of the team, you know? Um, there's a couple of people I've worked with, like Aston Martin, where I've even had my own desk there. They've given me so my far. own desk at the at the place, you know, and get invited to weddings, and christenings, and all this sort of thing. They almost see me as part of an off-site employee. So that's a good thing to do, but never take that for granted. And just be a nice person, you know? I mean, one of the things that... If you said to me, what's the best thing for a successful day in studio? I would say, apart from obviously producing what's needed on time, is have a good day. Because these people are investing a lot of time and a lot of money, and they'll probably come to studio themselves because their ass is on the line if it doesn't go right. So they want to keep an eye on you, no matter how much they work for you. You know, they want to be that little bit of control over the, over the little bits. If they have a really boring day or it's stressful, they've had a bad day. They've already probably yeah. had a few bad days at work that week, you know. If you make it easy for them, if you just say, right, so we're going to do this shoot in studio and we've got to do this, we've got to do that, and we need this and we need that, and the problems are this, this and that, right, I can solve those, leave them with me, I'll work it out and I'll come back to you to show you how we've done it. If you can do that, they can sit in the client room clearing emails and doing Teams meetings and have the total confidence that you're just going to crack on. That is a good day. It's a good day for them, an easy day for them. So when it comes to the next shoot, they'll be, let's get Tim. I like working with Tim. He just yeah. gets on with it. You know? That's that's one of the um, the client experience is so important. And I tell you what, one of the biggest best bits of advice I ever got when I was a kid, and I you know um, I wanted to I wanted to study music and be a you know be a professional guitarist. Um, the best piece of advice I was given when I asked somebody very famous, um, I said like, okay, so what you know what do I need to do to become a su successful at as a guitarist, like in the studio, for example? He goes like, well. Aside from any, everything that I expected him to say, because I thought, you know, he'll tell me, like, practice this, do that, you know. And what he said was, um, well, be on time, have a working car, and be a nice guy. Yeah. Because when yeah. you're working in a studio with other, you know, with a producer and other musicians, you're no. you're stuck in there with other people. And if <laughs> if you don't get on with people, or if you're, if you're just not a people person, then people won't come back and want to work with you again. It's, it makes right. perfect sense. Absolutely right. You A day in studio, a day on location, you see it as a... I mean, when I work in a location, in studio, the day goes really quick. Yeah, that's it. Oh, that goes like that. Because you're constantly thinking and you're constantly doing things and you're like, right, the relatives are over there getting that car re-cleaned and everything else and da 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 and You've told him not to black the tires because you don't want them shiny and... You've given him the stuff to use and you're trying to keep an eye on him doing that so he doesn't make a mistake while you're doing this. And the day goes really quick. Your clients that are coming down, their day goes really slow because they're just stood there watching you and they're like, I don't know yeah. what to do. And it's not the glamorous day out that they probably thought it was going to be, you know? So make it easy for them. But I think generally, just like you said, always be on time. If the shoot starts at 7 in the morning, be there at 6.30, 7 is not on time. 6.30 is on time. That's like an ex-military thing of mine. You, always early. <laughs> always early. First in, last to leave. You know? Be a nice person. And when problems arise, because they will, don't lose your shit. Never lose your shit in front of a client. Yeah. You know? I've had to do vehicles. I remember doing this massive... There's a, there's a, a company um, and they do... It's very difficult to describe, but if you imagine like a massive tanker, it looks like a like a like an oil tanker truck. But actually what it does is it cleans up waste water and waste chemicals, so it sucks it in rather than pushes it out. So this this company Dyson, they make these, but these are massive. They're probably bigger than an oil tanker. 
I remember doing one of those in studio and it was it was a big shoe. It was a lot of money involved. And I had valetors working on this truck undercover for four days cleaning it. And I got there and it's it's dark metallic blue, which is like, you know? And we started living it and we started shooting it and it all worked out fine. But one of the problems was because the tank is curved, I had to light across the top because there's part of the top which is really important for that. So it was a problem. The client's like aware of the fact that's going to be difficult to do. So he's popped his head into studio to see how we're doing, you know? And even me, with all my experience, things can throw at you. Experience will get you the answer quicker by peeling back on what you've done previously. And we ended up sticking a massive 10K light on the end of a massive boot about 25 feet in the air and then scrimming that with soft diffusion material and then running a 40 second exposure moving this thing along the top so we could almost like light paint it if you like. uh-huh. it was light painting and we did that but when i was doing that and the client was in studio i was just walking around and i was changing the, the spread settings of certain lights they didn't need changing i just needed three minutes to think but rather than stand there and go, oh, I'm not sure, uh, because that doesn't give a confidence, just go and tweak a few lights, change them, change them back, use your head, give yourself some breathing time to think, and then come back and go, I know exactly what I'm going to do. We'll do this. It'll work. I'll show you now. And you do it, and they go, wow, that's amazing. You know? So it's about, it's, it's about being a nice guy, but it's also about them being confident in you. And their confidence in you will come from the fact that you you don't get agitated by stuff, you know, because you will hit problems. I mean, the famous saying, you know, uh, prepare to succeed um, or plan to succeed and prepare to fail because there'll be failures every day, you know. Stuff will go wrong, sometimes on an epic scale. I remember doing a shoot with a Ferrari that was particularly expensive. It was about 40 and a half million pounds. Whoa. And it was one of six cars that I shot over six days in studio for that. And it was a series of work. It was like the legendary, the, the, the most legendary models of Ferrari. So like an SP1, which is fairly new, um, all the way down to this Luso, very pretty car. And it was in like, very it was almost like silver aston martin silver birch but it was the ferrari version and this had come off the covered transporter outside the studio right up to the doors of the studio and they were just about to wheel it in with the gloves on it was at, it had been cleaned for about two weeks people had been across the paintwork with micrometers to measure the depth and everything and it was perfect you know but where i was working they have two car studios. I was in studio one and in studio two was another company, a British car company and another set of photographer, another photographer, another set of teams. And they were shooting a really cheap, uh, new car. This, I won't get into who it is. And they, these things had just arrived off an uncovered trailer and they were outside the door. And just as we got the Lusso off, one of their guys just went with a hose and just went all over their car, which sprayed all over the loose though. But all the Italians are going, ah, like this. And we're like, God, how do we recover from this? But you just got to get past it, you know, and try and calm people down. And I made everyone a cup of tea because I'm famous for doing that. <laughs> um, and you get past it. It's just two hours of, of like, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do the third car second and we'll do the loose low third and we'll just crack on so it's never what people think people look at the end result and think oh you're so lucky it's so glamorous and you must be made of money and the reality is it's different you know yeah you get paid a lot of money to do this but i shoot Hasselblad and i try and change that every two years Hasselblad pixies don't put a new one under my pillow i have to buy it (laughs) yeah and um I don't, I don't ever allow a manufacturer to give me equipment for free of charge for me to promote it. So if I ever say on social media, this piece of equipment's really good, it's because I bought it, paid for it, used it, and thought it's really good. So I'm, I'm never an ambassador for anybody, which is probably a mistake, really. But 
Um, it's just the, the way I prefer to do it. I'd rather just buy equipment myself and use it. Um, so that can be costly. Change your hassle blood, 38,000 pounds. So, you know, I don't spend the weekends on a, on a yacht in the south of France. Um, I spend the weekends walking the dog and trying to work out how I'm going to do a quote for somebody or, <laughs> or a new client's approach me and I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay, I'll do a quote. So reality is great. Tim, it's, I know we're almost out of time. It's been absolutely fantastic. But one final thing. What advice would you give someone who is just starting out in their own photography business? What would be like your number one tip? On the positive side, I would say work hard, practice what you do, okay? And stick to what your gut says. So if you if you decide that you want to be a furniture photographer or you want to photograph staircases and you want to be the best staircase photographer in Europe, if that's what you really want to do, then do it and believe you can do it. If you if you do not believe in yourself, you can never expect anyone else to believe in you. And it's a really easy thing to say, but it's a hard thing to do. You've got to believe in yourself. And there will be times, as we both know, many of them along the way, where you don't believe in yourself anymore. So being a photographer, be careful what you wish for, because you're going to have to learn to deal with those moments. So on the positive side, I would say believe in yourself. If people, I mean, when I first started, when I, when I first started my business, about two months before, I went to talk to different commercial photographers who did different types of work, including cars. And they said, don't bother doing it, you won't succeed. And I'm like, why won't I succeed? And they went, well, you're too old. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just 40. You're too old, you don't live in London, and your work is a bit too artistic. It looks too artistic, you know, to be commercial. So interestingly, I'm nearly 20 years into this now. Well, yeah, but no, 16 years into it now. Interestingly, I don't live in London. I don't particularly like living in London or being in London. It's just a ball ache. You know, that's where everyone's <laughs> big at. Secondly, I might be like in my mid 50s now, but I don't feel that way. And it's just a number. And thirdly, if I get a new client and I say to them, so why did you choose me? Why Why do you like what I do? And they go, because your stuff is almost like art. And you're like, that's interesting, because that's the absolute opposite of what these people said. So go with your gut and go with what you think and stick to it and give it the best shot you can. But if it's not working, don't be afraid to change or adapt to the market, because you might be doing it for you, but you've always, you've always got to have an end customer. So there's got to be an end customer. If you can give, if you can find those sets of end customers, so people who make staircases, and people who make staircases could earn hundreds of thousands of pounds, and they all need photographing, and they all have brochures, and there's not many staircase photographers out there, or guitar photographers, or whoever, if you want to be the best at what you do, then go ahead and just do it. Do it. Because if you don't try, you might always regret it. That's the positive. On the other side of the coin, to balance, be aware of what you wish for. Just be aware of what you're wishing for. Because you're going to spend a lot of time working alone. You're going to spend a lot of time doubting yourself. There's going to be weeks when you've got thousands and thousands of pounds coming in. And then there's going to be a month or two where there's just nothing. Nobody pays the bill. There's nothing coming in. You're going to have to learn that you're going to have to adapt to that and 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 do that. I have periods. I do. 90, 2019 before COVID and lockdown and everything else was probably one of my best years. And in the latter parts of that year, that financial year leading up to April, I actually delayed invoicing clients because I'd invoiced out too much money. I was like, there's going to be too much profit going through this year. I want to try and push some of it into next year. So I actually made excuses and delayed invoicing clients. I had no idea COVID was around the corner and everything was suddenly about to change, but it does. So if you do work hard and you do start to make money, 
make sure you put a little bit aside, you know, you're not going to take massive profits in the first year or two years. So do put yourself a little bit of money aside. Make sure you pay your VAT bill on time and things like this because things are uncertain. And when it's when the harvest is great, pull it in, feed the family, reap the rewards. When it's a drought, make sure you've got a little bit of stuff at the side because I think... From my experience of when I've looked at different businesses, when I've talked about business, it, whether it's on stage in Vegas or in Zurich, about 83% of small businesses fail in the first 24 to 48 months because they put no money aside. They've just instantly tried to take everything out. Uh, so just make sure, you, make sure you're prepared for it. But if you do it and you work hard, it's the best thing you'll ever do. It's the best thing you'll ever do. Fantastic. Fantastic advice. That's applicable to any form of business, not necessarily only photography, but generally yep. um, that applies to all business. Uh, Tim, it's been an absolute education. Thank you so much for coming on no, the show. Um, it's been an absolutely fantastic conversation. Okay, folks, that's all for today. What an incredible chat. And if you like this episode, go on and check out Tim's website over on ambientlife.co.uk for some more incredible imagery. Also, let me recommend another couple of episodes that I think you'd like. Episode 7 with Dan Regent is all about shooting motorsport. And episode 17 with Dave Cox, it's all about night painting cars in LA during lockdown. Ninja style. A couple of early episodes, but I'm sure you'll love it. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fleshed video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guests' photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, we'd love to hear it. Your comments are incredibly valuable to us and help us improve our content. So please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Remember to hit the like button, ring the bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching, and I'll see you next Thursday. Bye.